What's going on, everyone? My name is Paul, and this is the Matrix BJJ podcast. Do you like jujitsu tournaments? I, I sure like jujitsu tournaments. We are going to be covering the Matrix Jiu-Jitsu Invitational Tournament on the 12th of March. This tournament will be happening in Kaiserslautern, in Germany at Matrix Jiu-Jitsu. The tournament will be a five-man round-robin submission-only event. There's going to be a 400 euro cash prize along with other prizes put up by some of our sponsors. We will have a free stream available of the event and that will be posted on all of our social media sites and our website. I'm really excited to be covering this event. I'll be doing commentary uh, along with two of my teammates, Yari and Christian, who know much more than me about (laughs) (laughs) jujitsu. I had to bring them on because I was like, guys, I'll just be sitting there saying like, you know, oh, he's going for a footlock uh, thing. And they, they actually know what they're talking about. For more information, go to Matrix.com and tune in on the 12th of March. My guest today is Phil Miglaris. Phil is a fifth degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu under the legendary Helsin Gracie. Phil owns and operates Balance Studios in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. In addition to being an accomplished jiu-jitsu instructor and pr- practitioner, Phil is also a master yogi and an excellent yoga teacher. He put out a DVD a long time ago called Yoga for Fighters. That DVD has been very helpful for many people in the martial arts community and a lot of folks who have never even trained martial arts. Phil started training jiu-jitsu in the early 90s, back when jiu-jitsu was completely unheard of in the United States. He started training under Steve Maxwell way back in the day, before anyone had even heard of this stuff that now seems to be so popular, seems to be everywhere. Phil was there at the very beginning. In this episode, we talk about uh, Phil's experiences training with the Gracies, training with Steve Maxwell, training uh, with tons of people all over the world, uh, his experiences teaching, coaching, doing yoga. We cover a lot of ground in this interview. I hope you guys enjoy the show as much as I enjoyed recording it. Please welcome Phil McLaurice. What's up, man? Thanks a lot for doing the show today. Thanks for having me, man. Right before we turned on this microphone, you were telling me about how Helson is still a badass at 60 years of age. Can you... Uh... Yeah, he's, he's 60-something. Oh, yeah, definitely still uh, still has, has it. And he's so technical and tenacious. Um, yeah, so every, every, I always tell everyone, like every time I see him, he always has something new for us. He's always showing moves. It's always a surprise. And I can see something I, that I know. I just see Helson do it. Like his body like mold into it. Mm-hmm. And I learned how to just be more efficient with, with space. So he's, you know, still pretty amazing. What is his, I mean, <laughs> it could be an obvious question. You could just say Helson Gracie Jiu Jitsu. But what would you say is like Helson's game? What types of moves does he usually go for when you're rolling with him? Uh, I mean, he has his core stuff that he does. Um, you know, his half guard, full guard stuff. It's very systematic. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of those things, he's just perfect. Yeah, Helson's really good in the scramble. Really? Very good. Hmm. Yeah, very, very good. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's hard to describe system because there's so many different parts that he teaches but the stuff that he shows he does perfectly you know and he'll do it in in training too and if he misses it he'll go back to it Hmm. it's cool yeah all i all i've done my whole life pretty much is try to mimic what he does and he stays pretty close to the way his dad did things ilio gracie system so Hmm. both in self-defense and then the ground system for more sportive things yeah yeah, exactly. Um, why did when you were tr- training with all the Gracies back in the day, when before anyone before the UFC was even a thing, uh, Helsing kind of took you under his wing, like more than the other ones. 
correct? Yeah, yeah, for sure. What do you think made made him do that? <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> I always ask myself that question. I'm all I'm always curious. And the way I met Helson, I, I like walked in on one of his privates, and I like, you know, I wasn't trying to be sneaky, but I like sat in the corner because um, uh, that's really kind of told me to sit, to sit, hang yeah. out. I mean, I was a little kid. And uh, he came over and just treated me like a superstar. I was like, hey, Helson Gracie, nice to meet you. Very pleasure to meet you. And um, I don't know. I think he liked the fact that I just always wanted to watch and learn and get better and, you know, be tougher. And I always connected with his personality, too, because he's really like a really nice guy. Yeah. He'll say hi to everybody. And that's just something, you know, my family's that way. And I just felt comfortable right away. And that's not to say his brothers are not like that, but... Mm. You know, I just connected a little bit more this way. Um, and I think you like the fact that I I like to mimic. So I, I like to mimic other styles, things that are not necessarily what I go for first when I, when I train. Yeah. But I like to know it just in case I have to teach it to some of the students to suit their body type. Um, so I did it with Helson. So I like, you know, I wanted to learn exactly the way what he was teaching, the exact way he was doing it, and you know, I'll, I'll never really get there, but I can get close. Yeah. So I think he, I think he appreciated that that I was very systematic, and so was he. Yeah, yeah. That you wanted to kind of mimic exactly how he was moving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're fighters. I mean, I come from a long generation of fighters myself, like from boxing and. Um, even kind of like street oriented <laughs> fighting, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I appreciated jujitsu day one. I'm like, wow, you can do this fighting thing and just make it easier by choking someone out. It's great. You don't have to put too much energy forward. Yes, yeah, so I was a believer day one. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Actually, my, my first experience with jujitsu were the um, Gracie in action tapes in like mm-hmm. the 80s, man. Um, got my hands, I think, my cousin handed me one. He was like, gotta check these guys out. So I, like, knew who the Gracies were, kind of. Yeah. Just by the video. We were just mimicking things we saw in the video. You know, mm-hmm. you get to a mount and the guy turns. We were just mimicking, like, the, the like fight choreography. And that's how I first learned jiu-jitsu, an arm bar. But I was doing it wrong. You know, you need instruction. Like, you can do it off a of video and then, let's say, with an arm bar, your knees are loose, the guy rips right out. Yeah. So... I didn't have that instruction. First instruction was maybe like a year or two later, something like that. But I must have gotten my hands on jujitsu tape in like 87 or something like that. I, I, was, I was trying to actually figure out the exact date. Um, and uh, it is around 87 that I, I started. And I must have been like a 10 or 11 year old kid. But I was already, like I said, I was already involved in like boxing and martial arts. Yeah, I like so I, I liked all that stuff. Basically, from tapes and random classes when I could. But when you know when I started jujitsu, I was like, man, I'm never gonna quit this. This is the greatest. Yeah. So, was your first like official training that was with Steve Maxwell, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He came over one day and was like, well, he, we were actually babysitting. I say we. I was hardly uh, of age to babysit but my, my mom was babysitting wow. Zach Maxwell oh cool yeah uh, little kid at the time and uh, Steve came over he's like hey he used to call me young Phil probably still does um, <clears throat> he said gotta come over do this stuff Gracie guys like he was telling me all about it and, uh, and I was like oh okay like I want to check this out and I think it was one or two times he told me and then I went over and um, just started training that day. It was a very, very small group, and mm-hmm. it was like the only group. There was nobody else on the East Coast training. No right. one. People that wanted to, but there was no place to go. It's so lucky. It's, it's crazy. Crazy, right? Yeah. And Steve's very like organized, and you know, he's got like a military sort of thing going on too with organization like mm-hmm. we do this first this second and it's very like physical fitness oriented classes yeah i think it was like that because the amount of techniques were limited mm-hmm. which i think is good and bad at the same time so we used to do this killer warm-ups because he's a fitness genius right exactly so he used to put us through these very specific drills and it was killer man 
Uh, not many people hung through there just because <laughs> it's physically challenging to get to the technique part. Yeah. You know, you're doing an hour of warm ups that a normal human wouldn't be able to do. <sighs> and then finally, when we got to the techniques, you know, you're dead tired. And, and actually, roll. part of his thinking was um, you have to be able to do this stuff tired. That's kind of the point of jujitsu. Mm hmm. Like even when you're you're beaten up and, and tired, you still have to be able to push forward with a technique that doesn't require so much of the gas tank. You so. know, I've actually heard that from I feel like that's a point of contention that a lot of people don't talk about in terms of instruction. Like some some people, some places I've trained are like, Oh, you must do like a CrossFit workout basically before you know, you're ready to start working the techniques because we mm -hmm. want you to be tired when you learn. And then other places are like, oh, no, never, never. We're just going to do a quick warm up. And then we want you to be like totally present, totally 100% yeah. ready for technique and then rolling. You know, and then you'll get your like workout. Like I said, done it's rolling. exercises for particular human beings. Yeah. You know, like the people that remained in the room were the toughest guys in the area. Mm hmm. That would go through that workout, that would go through, you know, moving around and then, you know, like the, everybody around me was good, even though we didn't know that much. Mm -hmm. Everyone, everyone was tough. So for the general public, I could tell you 100 percent, they don't want to go through this crazy workout just to learn a jujitsu move. Yeah. You understand? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, owning a business and seeing trends and just experimenting with types of classes i could tell you that much you lose students mm -hmm. but the people that remain are the hardcore dudes that should be competing so yeah. it's just like i said it's serving two different types of populations i i liked it because i was ready to go man i wanted to fight I wanted yeah. to compete i wanted to you know um so yeah that's how it was presented to me um and then i met um helson shortly after that but i met all the other gracies hoist was very young i remember he was like a boy I remember seeing him, and <laughs> I always tell this story, too. I, I, I literally thought the Gracies were superhumans, like like could fly or, really? you know, you could hit them, and it was like punching steel or something. <laughs> like I really did as a child. And then, um, and you know, and then I got a chance to know them, and they were human, and they shook my hand, and, you know, they were like normal people. Yeah. And I didn't have to call them master this, grandmaster that. Um that's still what I like about jujitsu. We're not very formal at Balance Studios where you have to call me Professor, Master Phil, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I like about jujitsu. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of schools have changed to bowing in. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just a, a different culture. So that, that's the culture that I like. And I think the people that enroll at the schools appreciate it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then, um, that, you know, that's what I liked about Helson when I met him. So, and Steve's like that too. Yeah, very relaxed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he's relaxed. He's a, Steve he's Maxwell's relaxed. intense. He's a good dude. Yeah. Uh, but that's the energy that you want from him. He, he yeah. pulls that out of you, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, even now, 41, I still have some serious stamina on the mat. It's because of Steve. You know, he instilled that uh, physical side of it, pushing yourself. Um, and then the jujitsu, let's say the guy's young. You're 41, let's say. Yeah. Like I am. And how old are you? 25. 25, yeah, yeah. You have way more energy than a 41-year-old, I would think, right? Uh, hopefully. Uh, yeah, hopefully. I hope so. Like normal 41-year-olds, you do. Like some ju like old school jujitsu. I'm just saying old school for the old people. Yeah. <laughs> and 40 is not really that old anymore. 40 is the new but, 25. Um, what's that? It's the new 25. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're basically but, you know, I keep up with all the younger guys. I don't yeah. know how much longer that will last. But – it comes from those warm ups. It comes yeah. from, you know, like a like a you know, a mindset that not everyone can deal with, like pressure. Mm -hmm. So you're competing, you're you know, Steve was an intense coach in that um, you know, he's tough, he's not gonna let you wuss out. Yeah. You're tired. And let yourself believe you're tired. And that's another detail. But at the same time you have to fall back on this great technique where Muscle doesn't mean anything anyway. You know, you mm -hmm. can run all over a muscled up guy that is willing to push himself. If he doesn't, you know, like the toughest guy in the world, zero technique, he pushes himself to the limit, uh, he's still going to get choked out. It doesn't yeah. matter. So th th there's a fine balance there of that, you know, 
technique, strategy, and then the ability to just go forever and, and never give up. Mm-hmm. Do you do something similar at balance? Like, do you have a similar type of warm up, or do you keep things yeah, a little more? Yeah, but I have se- I have separate times that we do it. Oh, gotcha. And, and for different populations of of um, of student here, yeah, you know the guys that do uh, that fight compete. Yeah, they have to do it. That's part of it. Conditioning is part of competition. Mm-hmm. It's part of excellence. So have to. Guy just getting started. He just wants to take some jujitsu lessons, and you know he didn't sign up for. A CrossFit workout or a Spartan race? Yeah, probably not. You know, not the best choice. No, no, it's not sustainable. Mm-hmm. And I, I could see it in the numbers of people who have enrolled where we have experimented. Yeah. Students drop off because they didn't sign up for physical fitness; they signed up for jujitsu. Yeah. So it has to be, you know, program direction is huge. You know, directing and 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 making sure that it's good for a general public. They get themselves, you know, they get their feet wet. And then they jump into that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's like later stuff for most people. Some people, they just want to do it right away. But that's not the majority. I could just tell you that. Mm -hmm. At Balance, do you guys run your classes? um, Like is there beginners and then advanced? Mm -hmm. Or is it more like competitors? No, we have a mixed level in between. But Mm -hmm. um, ours are like courses over just regular classes. So a course would be a very structured thing. Um, We follow Elio Gracie's way. Especially with our our 101 program, Mm -hmm. which are the fundamentals. Right. I don't really believe in beginner techniques. I don't believe that's even a thing. Yeah. There's no such thing as a beginner technique. There's a fundamental technique that you need. I use what would be called a beginner technique on black belts. You know? Yeah. I don't think it should be called beginner. But, you know, someone, I got um, someone in Americana, right? And they're like, man, I can't believe I got caught in a beginner technique. They're a black belt. Mm. And I'm like, that's not, you know, yeah. in the hands of another black belt that's been training a while, that's not a beginner technique. Yeah, you it's know, that's just that's a technique beginning. that just caught you. Yeah. <laughs> but you can get higher level guys with simple things because they think you're going to do something so high level mm. that, you know, you reach into the bag of tricks of low level stuff that anybody can do. It's easy to teach at Americana. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I like, I like all that stuff. I like, like high end complicated jujitsu as a puzzle and as a way of learning movement because not all the advanced techniques or, you know, sporty, fancy looking techniques are for you, but you should know them. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't use them every day, but you should know them. You should know how, definitely how to defend if you're competing against it or dealing with it. Um, and there are a lot of old school techniques that destroy new school stuff and vice versa. Mm-hmm. So in the end, they're just techniques. Do you think that there is kind of like in the argument of like new school jujitsu versus old school jujitsu? Do you think that do you think that's a thing or is it more like? Well, I don't know. Here's old... the question. I've always been curious. Like I'm a fan of quite a few guys out there, old school, new school. And there are people in between now. Mm-hmm. Um, let's let's give an example. Keenan Cornelius is he old school or new school? Yeah, exactly. You say. No, I want to. Maybe we'll ask people online. Is he old school? He'll get a kick out of it too. Yeah. <laughs> because he's right in between, I think now. So, what is are his moves still effective? Yeah, of course. You know. Yeah. The kid's good. But that's the question. Then what? What in between? So I think it comes down to um, arenas. So, <clears throat> you know, jiu-jitsu techniques are tools. They're tools for a specific place. And the place could be a sport match against a particular person, you know, to get very specific. Mm-hmm. Um, and they'll work. But if you take that same thing to the street, it might not work. If you take that street move to sport, it might not work. Yeah. So if you have the luxury, see, street fighting is different. You don't have a luxury to pick your opponent, to get the guy in the same weight class, to not throw strikes, yeah, you know? Yeah, exactly. You know, there's that surprise and social aspect to street defense. And you have to be smart on the street because one mistake and you're done. Mm-hmm. So um, that stuff, I believe, has to remain like so simple, you know, simple techniques that, that work. Yeah. Um, and then you have the luxury of watching your opponent on video and having fun with it, really. I mean, anybody that has fun in street fights, should, you know, I think they have a problem. But 
to be street ready, that's a different thing. It's very hard to train street ready. I don't care what course there is. Yeah. Because, you know, when we even when we say street, I think something that's more scary than a street fight. Like when you think street fight, you think of an actual city, right? Like yeah. in Philadelphia, New York. Farm fights are probably more scary because they don't stop. Exactly. Yeah. Two guys in the back, you know, yeah, on a I th- farm or in the backwoods. And no one stops it because everybody's bored. They want to see a fight. Yeah, I think about that all the time because I live in a city. And I think what, yeah. you know, I think all the time whenever I'm walking around, like, what would I do if that guy attacked me or this guy attacked me? I think, like, well, I'd run into this business that's literally right here. You know, yeah. they would call the police. Maybe someone would help. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, but if I was out in the woods or out in a farm and it's just me. Yeah, you're totally right. Yeah, it's scary. That's why I always say that, you know, like a beach fight. You see these Rio beach fights. They're, everybody watches and they're done in like two minutes. Yeah. Street fight, probably the same thing, but you have the, the very dangerous, dangerous concrete. Mm-hmm. Very dangerous. Yeah, for Especially sure. Especially if you're a ground fighter and you don't know how to utilize your, your body mm-hmm. on a piece of concrete or to take into account like situational awareness of a curb, a car, a fence. Different like story. That. Yeah, it's a huge difference. Um, and if you you know if you only think sport, and there's nothing wrong with only thinking sport, especially if that's what you do for a living. That's yeah. what you should be focused on. Um, and that's what's cool. People are like old school, new school, and they suggest that new school doesn't focus on self defense. There's a suggestion there, which is not. You can always come back to that stuff, mm-hmm. you know. And if you're not expected to be a self defense self defense instructor. You shouldn't really, you know, you don't really have a need for that stuff right now. It's not the most important thing. If you're an instructor and you don't know things right, there's a problem. You should not be showing self-defense techniques if you don't know them. Right. You know, they're, they're, yeah. they're, it's a particular way of doing them. Even Elio Gracie, he had a particular way of teaching them. Mm-hmm. And it was important to teach them in a certain order and uh, in a certain way so everyone gets them. Mm-hmm. They kind of build on each other. Yeah, they definitely do. And the greatest example of that, and it's laid there perfectly in Elio Gracie's book. Like, it's a great book, and um, it's still how I teach. So I haven't deviated from Elio Gracie's anything in 14 years. Mm -hmm. So, and we use it for teacher training, same book. What type of, uh, how is it structured exactly? I know some of it you maybe can't talk about, perhaps. Maybe it's like Gracie, Elio Gracie's Deepest Secrets. But, no. <laughs> you know, like, uh, how, how particularly do, does he structure it? Um, the order. I mean, it's hard to describe on a podcast. Mm-hmm. I mean, you yeah. start, you start standing up, fights mm-hmm. start standing up. That's the first piece. Um, and so that's stand up self-defense against different aggressions, front and back and chokes from the side, someone grabbing you, any way of someone invading your space, a punch, a kick, an elbow, all that stuff. So if someone's invading your space, you handle it with a, with a counter maneuver. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the stand-up Gracie self-defense. And Elio Gracie, you know, of course, he didn't invent jiu-jitsu. I don't think really anybody invented jiu-jitsu. I think it's just a human thing. And like any other human endeavor, there has been evolution of behavior and structure, especially with the Internet these days. I mean, jiu-jitsu is... You need to know about a hundred times more jujitsu because of what yeah. other people know. Yeah. But, um, you know, he made the most significant modification to an art. You know, and when I say art, this is combat. We're talking about straight combat. It's mm-hmm. very realistic. Like, if it doesn't work, throw it out. If this doesn't work, this technique, you throw it out. The same way someone who was working on a complicated website or uh, making some software or something like that, and if a part doesn't work, you throw it out and make it work somehow yeah so you know like it's like i was telling you before my mind that's how my brain works i work very technically mm-hmm. in my head when i work in technology when i work in jujitsu and yoga all it's all the same mindset so keep what works you can try to work on things that don't particularly work for somebody you know you yeah. can modify and that's what's cool about jujitsu there's constant innovation but at the same time there, you, you can also fall back on a tradition that just works. And on that, remember we were talking about my Facebook post? Yeah, I do. I asked people why they were fascinated and what belt they were. Well, one person said something, and I really can't find it right now because it's there's a hundred and something comments. But he said something like, um, 
you can like always fall back on the fundamentals. Like they're always they always have your back, something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, and it's true. Like I've never fallen back on like something fundamental, and and it didn't work just for a moment to like you know give you some breathing room. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll get the exact uh, exactly what he said, but that was the the gist of it. Yeah. And uh, I never thought of it that way. Like you fall back on 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 the fundamentals. Because you can try some sports stuff and you're like, whoa, that just did not work for my body or mm-hmm. it just doesn't work at all or I'm doing it wrong. Need you know? to drill it a few hundred more times before it's ready. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, like you just said, drill it 100, 200 more times. Anything that needs that much of drilling should not be a fundamental. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. a, that's a timing issue. Anything that takes like incredible timing, incredible, like too much is reserved for sport because it's a little bit more difficult to access, I think, mm-hmm. in the moment, uh, unless you've trained it a million times. So, you know, real fight is so simple. It's just don't get punched in the jaw and keep your hands up and clinch if you need to, get away if you need to, that sort of thing. What was it like to train with Alio Gracie so much? Like, um... uh, It was good, man. I, I like, you know, what was it, 90s? Yeah. My brother and I, we moved out to California, we worked and trained at the Gracie Academy, which was an interesting place. There were a lot more Gracies in there, like cousins and brothers. Mm-hmm. Uh, Huron and Henner do a great job over there now. and um, They were literally, they were kids when I was there. Man, I wish I could show you this video. I wish I could find it right now. It's kind of cool. It was actually me teaching the kids class. Uh, Henner and Huron were in there, oh, like yellow belts. And that's I was actually crazy. showing Henner, Henner a move. And Henner, Henner, um, is, you know, was he was born into the Gracie family, had that advantage, but is also very talented. Mm-hmm. And uh, the video is me showing an armbar, and he didn't he didn't really know it. I mean, he was a little kid; he didn't really know it. And then um, the video, you could see him like doing a little bit better, a little bit better. And within like two minutes, he had a perfect perfect armbar, and he, you know, still to the day, still does the armbar. And it's just the same armbar that his grandfather. Helson and his dad showed there's nothing different. Yeah, but it was interesting to see someone with that advantage, like born into something advantage, um, really just absorb information quickly mm-hmm. as a child. You know, just imagine how many times they did that. <sighs> a million. They just got they they learned to pass when they were five. Yeah, you know, perfectly. Like they couldn't make a mistake because they were doing it on one of their you know their their dad or their uncle or something like that or one of i mean there's always been great instructors non-gracies at the gracie academy Mm -hmm. so and by the way i i always say this i refer to these places gracie academy and helson's place then i refer to them because i don't know any other way you know it's not that other academies aren't as good i just haven't been there yeah same reason like you see my schools i don't have pictures of carlos gracie and there's a reason i never i never met carlos gracie and I like I want the imagery to be exactly what we've experienced in my schools. It's not just like I don't have pictures of Maeda or I have pictures of Elio Gracie. I have pictures of my Muay Thai instructors. I have pictures of Helson, you know, Elio, that sort of thing. Yeah. And they're all personalized pictures, too. Yeah. So I that like that. Sense. I like that because that's our, our history. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense. What a... Did you take? So you asked me what what it was like. I, I went off on a tangent. Oh no, it's Ellie fine. Gracie. We're all about was, tangents. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was. Uh, it, I moved out there for a long period of time. I would go out to the Gracie Academy in in Torrance like three months. Then I would come back home and actually go back to school. I was in college. So oh, cool. I'd go to college for we had trimesters at Drexel, um, and then uh, I'd go right back out. You know, I'd go back and forth. That's so cool. And um, then one time, and I don't know what year it was, 90s, um, I get a call. I said, Elio Gracie is moving to California for a little bit of time. I was like, I'm moving out there. And my brother moved out there because I wanted to, you know, like his hero status. It's yeah. just I want to go out there. I want to absorb. And, um, you know, I feel like all the Gracie, you know, Huron and Henner, let's say, so lucky to have all that time with their grandfather. Like, so mm. lucky. Not to the point where I was super jealous, but I was. I wanted to just soak it all up as much as I could out there. And there are a lot of other um, guys out there in the Gracie um, in the instructor program. It was like the original American instructor program yeah. for Gracie Jiu Jitsu. You know, we were the first group of people in there, 
And um, yeah, man, I was in there seven in the morning. I used to wake up bright and early. Crazy me, you were asking me about yoga. Mm -hmm. I used to do yoga at 5.30 to 7. I was in the academy already doing something at 7 o'clock. Like, you know, they had us cleaning and organizing and working for like Gracie gear, uh, organizing shirts. And then um, I would be in the back like folding towels with Elio Gracie. That's nearly nearly competitively with Elio Gracie, which he would never win because he folded a towel as perfectly as he did the technique. So. Um, that's what's kind of cool about him. Everything was technical. Mm-hmm. So whether you're doing a towel or your shoes or yeah. cleaning or something on the mat, that 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 was the way. I've and um, we used to have these really cool instructor classes. Like it was like, I think it was Thursdays that Elio Gracie would teach. It's insane, you know. I mean, I met Elio Gracie in his seventies, and you know, he passed in his nineties, and um, you know, he's still teaching class. This, this, and then doing everything perfectly too, still, and teaching emotionally. Wow, you know, with yeah. with with energy. Yeah. So I just love what he was talking about. Still in seventy, you know, however many years of jujitsu he was in, it's pretty interesting. I know he attributed a lot of that to his diet. Would you agree with that? Oh, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, yeah. There's no doubt. Hundred uh, percent. Mm-hmm. Everything was fresh fruit. Gracie Academy at that point. I've never been to the new one. I assume they have their juice bar, but, um, you know, it wasn't uncommon to see Elio Gracie behind the counter making himself a juice or someone else making him, you know, watermelon, banana shake, which is the best. And I still do it these days and it's outstanding. So yeah, if you want to improve your jujitsu without training jujitsu, improve your diet. Mm -hmm. You know, you really think about that longevity because if you want to train a couple times a day or be a good teacher, you have to put nutrients back in your body to be able to have the energy to move forward in the Mm -hmm. day um that's one of the reasons why i think the gracie diet is important um and i and i you know i do a slightly modified gracie diet still um i followed it very closely around when i was like 14 and 15 um i had acne all over my face i was like a little kid and i was like man i need to eat better uh, without exaggeration, within a month, everything went away on my face. I changed and I didn't combine certain foods and yeah. I eliminated others. My skin cleared up right away. It was crazy. Yeah. I don't know if it was a coincidence or whatever, whatever. man. It just went away. So Yeah, I did uh, the Gracie just, diet for like two years and uh, it's legit. It's legit. Yeah. Real legit. But even to the extent of combining fruits, mm. certain fruits don't go together or, you know, they're eat more easily digested, so that's another concept. You, you know, you digest faster and more efficiently. You can train faster. You can mm-hmm. get back on that mat faster. Yeah, I like I said, I did follow it for a long time. Um, I have not. I still kind of feel like I followed it for so long that it's almost like a habit. You know, mm-hmm. it's to the point where um, if I'm gonna make a meal for myself, I just kind of automatically make it in accordance with the diet. If that makes sense, like. Yeah, that's um, good. You know, but I still, I mean, Elio Gracie would be mad at me. It's still, yeah, I still stray. Probably at least like once a day, I'd, I have a meal that would not be Gracie diet approved. But whenever <laughs> I... Whenever, hey, man, I think all of the Gracies sneak their, their secret meals anyway. That's my, that's my <laughs> suspicion. So, yeah, but I, the closer you get to Whole Foods, not, yeah. not the store, but right. actual Whole Foods. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you go broke if you get too close to Whole Foods. Yeah, you automatically. <laughs> <laughs> ah, here we go. I'm gonna quoting my friend Scott Lissy on uh, on Facebook. He said, "I love the fact that the fundamental techniques will never let you down." Black belt Scott Lissy. He's mm-hmm. one of my good friends. He trained at the Gracie Academy. He's a um, very very big guy. Um, scary big, very fast, <laughs> and uh, very, very good at jiu-jitsu. So if you're listening to this, Scott Lissy gets a little shout-out here. Um, and uh, that, it, I mean, it's huge. It's, it's such, a, such a great quote. The fundamental techniques will never let you down. So, yeah. Sport techniques have let me down many, many times. Uh, honestly, man, just because of creativity, I've tried some. And... It's not that they're you're just doing them wrong. Yeah. Not you. Me too. Yeah, I, I agree. Gone and like you play around with them and they don't quite work that well or yeah. something's just wrong or the timing is not there or 
the proper aggression or body weight's not there. That's yeah. why it doesn't work. You yeah. know, he has to be doing something sometimes higher level specific to have this thing work. Mm-hmm. So if you don't have higher level specific movement, you can't do that like fancy thing. Exactly. So there you go. Exactly. My coach was showing me today uh, really fancy inverted inverted guard to four eleven leg lock setup from you know all a crazy position. And I was like, this is crazy. This is pretty high level. He was like, yeah, you know, I was watching one of Eddie Cummings' fights, and he does this, so now I'm going to drill it, and we're going to, you know, practice it a few times. And um, I wasn't getting it. And whenever something like that happens, I used to get, like, sad. I used to think, like, man, this technique doesn't work. I suck, whatever. And then I think, like, when I first started jiu-jitsu, an arm bar was, like, impossible, you know? It's the same thing. Yeah. But then I drill it over and over like again. With Eddie, Eddie learned very systematically. Yeah. So there's a whole leg lock system out there, like how you learn 101 to super advanced that's yep. still evolving. Um, and how it kind of meshes with uh, gi and no gi uh, traditional sport. Um, that's where you start. I have the guys doing it here. And I go, stop doing this advanced stuff and flipping in the stuff. Start. Like we start with the regular toehold. That's mm-hmm. the entry. That's the entry part of the entry system to the more like more of the heel hooks and you know. Yeah. I call them control taps, meaning like I, I don't even go after a heel if I don't have everything else controlled and my own feet mm-hmm. protected. Yes. Yes. I don't. I don't even try them because you get something reversed on you with the guys like a little bit better, a little bit faster, a little bit more scrambly. Mm-hmm. I have full control submissions when I go for the legs. And secondly, and I and I, I want to speak to the older guys out there that don't do foot locks or want to learn. I'm talking about older people. Let's say older people are over 40. Yeah. <laughs> Leg locks are grand equalizers to age because you'll have a constant attack. If you're only attacking upper body, uh, younger, stronger, bigger guy, it's always going to give you a problem. But I keep attacking. Like, just, I, I don't really attack. I bug people. Yeah. Like, I could have gotten this. I could have gotten that. I didn't put all my energy into it. But I keep people moving. And I see, especially on younger guys, like, because they can overcome, like, a, like someone who's weaker, you can overcome them sometimes. Just mm-hmm. push their leg or move them. But if you're, like, flowing into this other, like, leg lock or something like that, they're on the defensive. Yep. So it's a way, I, I think it's a nice equalizer to, um, you know, you're fighting a 20-year-old, 40-year-old guy can keep up and stay uh, competitive with a younger mm. guy. That's um, kind of similar to something Dean Lister said at his last seminar when he, he came out here in September. And right. um, he was talking about how leg locks should be used to pass the guard. He yes. said, yeah. So true. Exactly. So true. Yeah, like I remember Dean. I was in the Gracie Academy, and Fabio Santos, who's, if you guys don't know Fabio Santos, Google Fabio Santos, great jiu-jitsu guy out in San Diego, red black belt, great guy. So one of uh, Dean's instructors, Yeah. and he was like, you know, he would call me like, man, you got to train with this kid Dean. He was a blue belt at the time. He's like, he's amazing, this and that. And I remember he came to the academy and was footlocking people. Right. Just footlock, straight footlock, not yeah. heel hooks, nothing like that. It's just really, really great going belly down on that footlock. It's cool. And um, but he was doing it back in the day, you know. Yeah. And then even one of our black belts, um, he was like the king of leg locks before anyone even knew them. Black belts in jujitsu didn't even know them, and that's Ken Cronenberg, and he's up in uh, he owns Tai Kai in Syracuse. He's a balanced black belt, one of our black belts. Oh, that's and, awesome. Um, he was the original, one of the original leg lock guys in America, and uh, he should be recognized. He submitted so many black belts as uh, I don't even know what belt he was with leg locks because they were just unaware. I remember good competitor. Um, I think he might be a Hoyler black belt, uh, Hages Lebre, and then I'm, I'm maybe saying his last name wrong, but it was like a seven second fight. I don't know. It was a very fast fight. Yeah. And he um, caught the heel hook right, right away. I think it was a no-gi match. Yeah, mm-hmm. no-gi match. And just, boom, caught it. But there were guys using the leg lock systems like, way back. They were just considered like the anti-jujitsu people. Yeah, Sambo or something. Or Yeah. No, jujitsu is, is what works. Right. You know? 
And if you're hanging on someone's leg and they get hurt because they don't understand it, you know, how to mm-hmm. twist out of a leg lock the right way, um, that's why you tap. Yeah, you know? exactly. I don't know. People are scared to tap and it's ridiculous. Yeah, that's something else that's- Dean said at his seminar too was that he thinks heel hooks are, in his opinion, uh, just as dangerous as Kimura's. But yeah. we, we all know yeah. we all know how to when to tap from a Kimura because you you learn it like in your first week of jujitsu. You know, yeah, most of the time. you don't understand the range of a heel hook. It's a sh- very short range. I yeah. mean, it's only like you, you twist three inches to the right and you can yeah. blow out someone's you knees. Half the Kimura, you have there's more thinking time in there. Right. And like I said, anything you're not training, you're not you're gonna you're gonna suck at it. So. Yeah. If you, and if you don't find value or you avoid the leg guys all the time, you never learn. So I've always been both. That's one good thing. I, I just uncovered because I moved. So I moved like from my house. Yeah. And man, one of these days I'm going to publish some of these videos I have. It's amazing. I have old school Hicks and Gracie beating up everyone in the academy videos. <laughs> unpublished. No one in the world has seen these things. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I have voice training for the UFC because I was always the guy with the camera. I always had cool cameras when mm-hmm. nobody else had cameras. Right. Um, very old school, like uh, Gracie Challenge sort of things. Yeah. You know, my brother and I did a couple at the Gracie Academy in Philadelphia. Like we were the dudes that like. Now, thinking about it, like the only guy's crazy enough to do this. Like, you imagine like waking up on a Saturday, you, right? Mm. You have to go into your academy and go fight somebody just because they said it didn't work. No thanks. It just didn't work. Huh? <laughs> That'd be a bad, bad morning for yeah. me. <laughs> It'd no, be fun, I mean, though. like now people know stuff. Then, you know, there was something about like, oh, I know this stuff. I'm going to kick their butt. Or they're saying something about jujitsu. Yeah. We're going to show them that it works. Yeah, we used to basically every saturday and there are a lot of uh guys that could back me up and that were in that in those rooms uh, my brother ricardo miglaris um who else was there like tim carpenter black belt my cousin frank ambrifi jared wiener if you know jared mm-hmm. everybody was in that room people would come in and be like no this doesn't work and we were like yep it works and we we're fighting every pretty much every uh every saturday yeah in that's Philly. nuts it is nuts. It's, it's nuts. definitely nuts. I don't even know how I got into telling you that, but that's, you know, you talk about old school and mentality. Was there anyone who gave, ever gave you a challenge? Like, was there, was it ever uh, close? Yeah, I got, dude, I, I faked one fight. Oh, man, this guy caught me so nicely in my stomach. Mm-hmm. And he caught me with, I forget, it was a punch. Yeah. He caught me, but I just, like, are you asking like that? Like, with the challenges, yeah. no. They didn't know what was going to hit them. Mm-hmm. If it happened these days, dude, I would have a fight every day because they're studying YouTube. They're probably yeah. trained at a school somewhere. You know, I'm gonna have a fight. Yeah. But back then, they didn't know anything. So, and there was no media to improve their knowledge. Meaning, you can't just log on the YouTube and find a move and try it. Right. There's no, you know, no way to keep up now. Yeah, obviously, there are easy ways to keep up and to be competitive. But back then, no. And it was that was kind of the point. Mm-hmm. It was to bring attention. You know, these high-end martial artists and other things would lose and wake up. And now everyone, you know, there's nobody in the UFC, I hope, that doesn't have some sort of jiu-jitsu. Um, you know, maybe they don't train it every day, but they're, they're, they at least know what it is and they respect it. Um, but anyway, I was going to say, these videos, mm-hmm. that's how we got into that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I came across so many, so many cool videos, like very old school videos. And going back to leg locks, I have a video of me. It, it, I think it was 1990 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, with Steve Maxwell, he's going through like showing me some foot locks, belly down foot locks, toe holds. Uh, it's very cool. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. So I mean, I'm, I mean, Steve's great black belt now, but yeah. he was a blue belt then, and it, the moves were kind of loose. You know, like he could have tightened up the knees. Like yeah. I could see it now as a black belt. He could look back and go, look how wrong that was. Yeah. <laughs> how much better that could have been. I mean, I did the same thing. I was like, yeah, I look back at a white belt tournament I did. I'm like, what was I doing? I was yeah. like, I don't know what I was doing. But I was a tough little kid. And so anytime there was like somebody that would be, uh, you know, like suitable for me to go against, uh, Maxwell would put me in like a little challenge match. It would yeah. be cool. That's cool, man. And I've done, like, grappling only and then ones with strikes. Yeah. Man, that's so cool. 
That's so but cool. these days it doesn't make sense because it's not driving towards more attention towards jujitsu. It just you know be gratuitous. Yeah, I also feel like uh, I mean maybe I'm totally wrong, but I've I've never really met people from other styles. People from other styles seem to respect jujitsu pretty yeah pretty much yeah. you know you have to yeah like i mean the point has been made if anything people in other styles who i've talked to who are still not sold on jujitsu they're usually not sold because they think it's like too athletic you know they mm. think like i used to train i used to train uh ninjutsu kind of a yeah. you know i'm kind of a badass when it comes to that but uh you know i could throw some ninja stars and things like this but i was too man don't worry about it i was too <laughs> oh yeah um yeah it's my little hidden secret on the mats but uh there's uh guys who i train ninjutsu with who i would try to get them to do jujitsu once i once i realized jujitsu was better and i was like yeah. okay fuck this ninjutsu stuff it's uh <laughs> jujitsu all the way and i tried to like some of the guys who i was friends with i was like hey come train jujitsu and um they would be like no no it's too athletic like i've seen videos like I'm not, I'm not in the best shape. You know, I'm getting too old. I don't want to get hurt. Things like that. And I'm like, yeah. you know, you don't get it. It, you will get in better shape. And also, it's not like once you learn how to relax and control your breathing and things like this, then you're gonna be fine. Like, I bet back in the day, the real ninjas really knew jujitsu for sure. Seriously, for sure. like they jumped on someone's back, choked them out, or hit them in the head with. A nunchuck or something. Yeah, I don't know, exactly. But like they definitely. I'm pretty sure that. I mean, the samurai. Samurai obviously knew jujitsu. Yeah. They're the ones who created it. So if the ninja were fighting the samurai in some sort of you know CIA level covert operation or something, got to know yeah. some jujitsu. You can't. Like I said, I don't really think anybody created it. Yeah. I don't think anyone was that smart to actually create a whole system because you know it's a full organism. You need. Uh, you need Andre Galvao to move the whole jiu-jitsu forward as it, as you would need the Gracies and all these other people to continue the pressure forward to what the current system is, mm -hmm. like the current knowledge of jiu-jitsu. Yeah. So, like, we're all, like, little pieces of the total puzzle. And, um, you know, even back then, it was just like maybe there weren't so many people training and, and teaching and everyone had their particular moves that add it to like a collective style you know and that's what and then it plopped down in brazil with maeda and all of those moves that he knew from the collection of people in japan became this other thing in brazil and it's becoming definitely a better uh not better mark my words there's no better in jiu-jitsu mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's becoming something interesting in america yeah um for sure you know like it's it should be valued i mean i um overseas same thing you know you're sitting in germany where people are practicing jiu-jitsu which even 10 years ago was different yeah for sure you know like i don't know if there was a black belt in 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 germany 10 years ago i don't think that's so not that long yeah, there's still not, not very long. many yeah our our um uh ray butcher is our black belt in ireland and i think he was the third black belt in ireland yeah uh, he got his black belt maybe you know like eight nine years ago or maybe less yeah. i forget um yeah actually not even that long ago but you know um overseas you know there there were uh, a lot i was surprised too because all the guys were very good yeah uh, very but good. just didn't have the instructors and the lineage and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. to legitimize their you know belt ranking now yeah. it's just everywhere yeah, there's some places that I've been to, like during just traveling around Europe and stuff like that, where I've been shocked at how good they are. Like, oh yeah, because they were held back. Yeah, you know? like in uh, a yeah. Croatia. I was in Croatia last summer, um, actually for a jujitsu camp. I don't know if you have ever heard of him, uh, Leonardo Neves. He's a third degree black belt. Um, he he's in Luxembourg, but uh, he okay. has a huge association in Europe. And um, he has a, a camp down in Croatia, kind of like a team camp. You know, we're all going to go down to Croatia and be on the beach and then train jiu-jitsu. And the Croatian guys that I met were so good. Like, yeah. just so technical, but also just ridiculously athletic. We have a Fantastic. little club in Aruba. Aruba's a very small island. Yeah. Population is not so huge. Right. 
uh, my cousin Frank Ambrifi, my brother, and I went a couple times teaching. And uh, man, the guys were good. They're mm-hmm. tenacious and good, and they watch as many videos as possible. And that's actually how I got yeah. um, in, connected with those guys in Aruba through my newsletter, Jiu-Jitsu Majors. You were mm-hmm. asking me about that. Right. And, you know, at a point, that was like a major resource for people around the world. They didn't have an instructor. So they looked out for my videos every month. Kind of crazy. And I've gotten a bunch of emails back like, thank you. We don't get much technique. Yeah. Thank you for the, you know. And uh, so we linked up with the guys in Aruba. And, man, I was so impressed how good they were. Yeah. Without having a black belt there all the time. A lot of the forever. times they're so athletic and dedicated you know they're so dedicated like they find a video or they find some online resource that they really like and then they just do it till they're perfect and they can do it and and that's what we did coming up because we didn't have the internet in the 90s and uh so we just took what helson showed us repeated it a million times um i taught as a blue belt but i taught content or like curriculum based stuff like if helson showed this for the next three months before he came back i'm showing all this stuff chopped up you know, we did a lot of training and a lot of fitness stuff because they said we weren't the most technical because we just didn't know it. Steve, on the other hand, was a wrestler. Right. And, um, you know, I, as I look back, a lot of what I know stand up. I love wrestling. It's like one of my favorite sports. Mm-hmm. I, I think they're the best athletes on the planet. Yeah. And I uh, highly respect it. Um, but Steve taught us wrestling slash jujitsu, not just jujitsu. Mm-hmm. So we had pretty good no. I had really good no gi when no one did no gi. Everyone yeah. like it was unheard of for a Brazilian to take the gi off at at certain points. Not every Brazilian, but in general, everyone used the gi. So when the gi came off, I was actually better than someone who's kicking my butt in the gi mm-hmm. because I knew how to grip and I knew how to move around. Yeah, how to wrestle. Yeah, yeah, to wrestle with no gi. Those were the days when no gi was just like a t-shirt and you roll up your gi pants. Right. That was no gi. <laughs> And then it became this like speedo thing when more Brazilians came to, 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 to America, which I never did one time. I'll just roll, I rolled up my gi every single time. I couldn't do it. <laughs> and and now, then you... now I like the board shorts. And, you know, spats are always good, man. No gi saves mm-hmm. your skin, yeah. keeps you warm, you know. Warmth They're is very, nice. Just, and I'll say it on every podcast to the whole United States and world. Please wear shorts with your spats. Yes. Okay? That's all That's all I want to say. And that's not old school. There are a lot of new school guys that are behind me. And I'm, it, it sounds like a good movement to start. Yeah. <laughs> I'm signing up. <laughs> I, was, I was wearing, um, I don't know if you've seen, but along with this podcast, along with this podcast, we, uh, we have a video service going on too for Matrix mm-hmm. where we're posting like narrated sparring and other oh, cool. other shit but uh and um i saw a video of myself in there uh like that we did a video of me sparring and i wasn't wearing shorts with my spats and Uh-oh. i and i was like like usually i'm like i'm good right and then i saw this video and i was like no nope. t- time to wear shorts you gotta wear i apologize shorts. to everyone but uh <laughs> and you need to wear something under the spats too. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> you got three layers there's three layers yeah. of spats but um but they're nice i like my spats yeah, like I said, they're, they're, I've, I've been doing – well, I started – I was the original guy wearing spats in jiu-jitsu. Can, mm-hmm. we, can we just state that? Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> but my spats were different because they didn't have things called spats or leggings or whatever. They were actually used for bikers. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I used them because the old school that we had hardly had um, heat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I was like, man, I'm going to bundle up. And I did, you know, I did it accidentally. So I, I had like a T-shirt. Um, these biking spat things. The bad part about these spat things is they had a zipper on the ankle. They, they weren't just like you pull them up. They would zip up and down. So I think a couple people got that in their face. But <laughs> Yeah, but I knew Legit. back then the value of, you know, if you want to do some flexibility training and you want to keep your joints warm, yeah. they're very, very helpful. Exactly. So I always tell everyone to wear them on multiple levels, cleanliness, um, protecting your own skin, Wear yeah. a long sleeve spat, yeah. And so. um, and they look cool. So what's wrong with looking cool? No, no. <laughs> Stay simple. <laughs> I mean, you could definitely <laughs> express yourself with them. So I've seen every variation. 
Oh, I'm sure. One guy, um, I, I started out in judo, and one of the guys who I trained with, uh, Jim, Judo Jim, we would call him. He was so fucking good. Everybody has a judo somebody in their school. Yep, Judo Jim. He was so fucking good. Jim, if you're ever listening to this, you're the man. But uh, he would wear football pads underneath his gi. Like, he had Under Armour... Uh, oh, Under oh, Armour yeah, yeah, yeah. underwear, but it had like football pads built into the underwear, and yeah. he would wear those <laughs> because he only had um, Jim. I hope this isn't like too much information, but he only had one testicle, so oh, so he was like, <laughs> yeah, so he was like, I gotta protect it, like yeah. So he would have literally football pad underwear, and I've always I never know where he got those, but I mean I get I bet I could find them online, but. Um, those were legit. Like he would take a break fall and he would get back up and he'd be like, didn't didn't even feel it. Like, hey, why not? Like totally compression good. wear with padding, so you never like bumped your elbow. And... Yeah, be cool. Yeah, it's definitely cool. Be pretty cool. But it's interesting. Like I've seen an evolution of products, not yeah. just techniques, but products over the years. Oh, I bet. In both jujitsu and yoga, you know, like when I started yoga, there were no sticky mats. Now you see them in like Walmart. Yeah, where anywhere on the corner, you can go buy one. <laughs> Moving into yoga, do you feel like the sticky mat is cheating, or is it? No, no, no. It's the same, man. There, there's so many arguments like what's right in yoga. Mm-hmm. What's ultimately right in yoga is when you practice your postures, you're breathing consciously and doing your posture. Mm-hmm. That's it. You can do it on a table. Yeah. You can do it on a building. You can do it on a mat. You can. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like thousands of years ago, they were doing it on animal fur. So a tiger's fur, you know, mm-hmm. like seriously. Yeah. Um, there are images of the Maharaj doing yoga downward dog on a tiger's skin. Like it's a nuts. bad motherfucker. But I think tiger skin is the ultimate, you know, yoga mat. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. I feel terrible. <laughs> Maybe a sticky tiger mat. <laughs> no, there, there are fake fur ones that look cool. So I would do it on that. Just yeah. Effects. <laughs> so um, no, they. Uh, the sticky mats are good. They've they've kept people safe because yeah. when you do it on a blanket or even on a mat like a jujitsu mat that's not that sticky and you start sweating. Yeah. Um, you it's know. Hard. There, I mean, then and then there are different types of yoga where you don't sweat that much at all. Mm-hmm. But the yoga that I think that physically helps jujitsu more is something that gets your body warm. Yeah. So. I agree. You do Ashtanga, Ashtanga yoga, right? I do, yeah. I, I've done all types of yoga. The one that I connected to the most was the Ashtanga practice. Um, still do it today. I still do it every day. And uh, I'm about to do it right after we get off, too. Mm-hmm. I'll be levitating. Um, and it's important for me, especially with what I do for a living, to have a constant practice. Secondly, it helps me keep my body rehab from being hurt when i was little so yeah. um mine's twofold like it keeps me healthy and on the mat and then you know keeps me walking properly and not needing hip surgery so yeah the big deal <sighs> yeah what uh how intense do you usually make your yoga sessions Are they i don't relaxed? really think in being intense man because i ultimately in my core is lazy and i don't want to think i'm doing this crazy workout and so uh, each day I get on my mat and and I only commit to five sun salutations. If you know what you said you were doing some, yeah. some yeah, yoga, yeah. so you know what the sun salutation is. So in my brain, my lazy brain, I commit to five. Mm-hmm. Once you get past five, your body's warm, you get like motivated, and you just go for another hour and a half. Yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> you know, that, that tends to, that's what I've been doing for like 30 years, you know. Yeah. Uh, when I was a kid, I learned yoga really young when I was eight. And it was just like sitting down, taking poses and breathing. It wasn't this like sweaty mess. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot from that in the realm of like focus and consciousness and um, like a health benefit, you know, like a health focus of yoga instead of like how could it help me choke someone unconscious faster, which, you know, it definitely does inform your jujitsu. And one really funny story about yoga, like I just been, I've been telling everyone in the jujitsu world for the last 30 years, go do yoga somehow, Yeah. you know, and then, <clears throat> you know, there are a lot of people you were saying you do one yoga program and another, like there are a bunch out online 
jujitsu guys doing um, yoga as well and teaching systems, I think is awesome. Yeah. Um, it takes the weight off of me too because I'm like, you know, people call me all the time to do interviews about yoga. I'm like, this is the interview. Go to a class. Yeah. It's really easy. Like you don't have to hear me say it anymore. Yeah. That's where a Yoga for Fighters DVD came from. I, I like, I, um, I had the uh, Jiu Jitsu Matrix newsletter, like my email newsletter. Right. And I would send out Jiu Jitsu on there, and instead of getting questions back about Jiu Jitsu, <laughs> they asked me yoga yoga questions. <laughs> and it, it got so big, like it got I got so many about yoga. I'm like, man, I really have to do something here. And then um, I've had different like. Uh, yoga for fighters um, installations like, yeah yeah I was gonna say like incarnations of it yeah like, the first one was a digital download yeah that that uh, I used a company pay 20 bucks 30 bucks and you got the whole thing you know and then people were asking me for like hey man we want a DVD you know and then I made a DVD and then then it became an app and that's where we are now and um, as of Sometime this year, the uh, the Yoga for Fighters website is getting updated. There's a little back-end membership site. Yeah. It's very small. I've had the same dedicated people on there for the last, like, eight years. Wow. And um, <clears throat> I've been shooting a lot more video. And I have a uh, very specific – I have a Yoga for Muay Thai section, Yoga for BJJ section. And then when I say BJJ, I really focus on the people wearing kimonos. Okay. So, um, I don't know if that download is ready. It's like yogaforbjj.com. Hold mm-hmm. on. I don't know if they prepared that yet. <laughs> um, so, yeah, specific things to do with your gi and how to breathe properly with that gi. I have uh, some developers are working on on. Yeah, no, that just goes to Yoga for Fighters still. <laughs> but we have... Uh, Got some big things in the works. Yeah, not big things. I mean, I want useful things, you know? Right. I'm not, you know, like... All right. I don't know what's going on here, but um, I will show it to you later. But yeah, and like you get down to the nitty gritty, it's just breathing and moving together. You yeah, know? yeah, that's what you're talking about before we started the episode. Is that the importance of yoga just being breathing and moving together? I think mm-hmm. that's a really good way to put it. I found it to be so beneficial for me ever since I started. I feel like I can roll for longer, you know, without getting tired. I can go uh-huh. for a few hours without getting tired. I can, yeah. you know, I can. It's awesome. I can do. Well, I can, you're more efficient because you understand your body a little bit better too. Yeah, There's, exactly. You, you know, you know how you bend. That's why I have an easier time with flexible fighters that other people have problems with because mm-hmm. I understand the range of the body. Yeah, and I understand what you can do and what you can't do. I mean, yo, um, flexibility is not the best thing for jujitsu because you can get yourself wrapped up in bad places. Right. So you have to have what I consider like functional flexibility. So, um, you know, leverage in jiu-jitsu is not derived by flexibility. It could actually hurt you. Mm-hmm. So at certain angles, like a 90-degree angle of an arm is leverage. So you can use that in certain ways that's very powerful just because of the angle of the bones. Yeah, yeah. But, um, there, and, it's, and it's the same thing, same power in a yoga posture. So you learn different angles, not just like doing splits or, you know, doing a rubber guard situation. Um, so sometimes, like I'm saying, the most extreme flexibility is not the most functional thing for jujitsu at all. So, but health wise and balancing your body, it's huge. So as a, a rehab sort of thing. So I don't see, I, just my personal opinion, I don't see yoga as entertainment. Mm-hmm. I see it as a very functional I don't take it too seriously either, but yeah. it is an important thing to be serious about because you can get hurt doing yoga. If you do it improperly or you do it for the wrong reason, you can hurt yourself mm-hmm. in two ways. You can hurt yourself. I mean, maybe even three physically, mentally and emotionally because mm-hmm. you're dealing with like, you know, deep stuff. So, you know, I actually, what's funny is I see yoga now, like you look up yoga on, let's say Instagram, what do you get? You get lots and lots of hashtag yoga inspiration where people are, you know, <laughs> twisting into weird positions. and uh, that Yeah, you probably... it's like if you look at everyone's accounts, it's all the same account. Yeah. But they're like, getting, you know, it's a profession too. So they're doing the poses. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to find the good in it. And if anything, it brings your attention more to yoga that you need to practice. But 
you know, maybe those things that you see there aren't the exact reason you should do yoga. Yeah. I, like we were talking about before, I do yoga for BJJ and uh, yeah. Sebastian Brosh, he's the guy who does all the videos. And one thing that he was saying in one of the videos that I did uh, a couple time, a couple a couple sessions ago, he said, don't be a sensation hunter. He said, like, don't... Sensation hunter. Yeah. Like, don't be in, like, for example, don't be in a pose and... Maybe you're you're in some crazy pose and you're like chasing. I, I, do, I feel like this all the time. So like you're chasing that feeling where you're like my muscle is just tight right over here. And if I move like an inch to the left and maybe breathe a little bit more then maybe it'll help. You know what I mean? And he, mm. was, he was saying like just do the pose. Just relax. You yeah. know, do the pose. Breathe. Don't like chase – you know, you're not getting like a massage. You know what I mean? Right. Like you're not, you're not trying to like iron out all the little knots in your body. You're just, you know, relaxing. And sometimes it's layering, so it's not just that one particular pose. I'm not sure his background if like if it's an Ashtanga sort of thing. Like the Ashtanga sequence is a layered. Yeah, sort of he does Vinyasa, I believe. Vinyasa, yeah. yeah. So that's great. Pretty similar. Um, yeah, I mean that's where like the Vinyasa is like the remix of. Ashtanga. Ashtanga yeah. is a set system, never changes, always in the same order, but not. But that's not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. It's a nice base system for people to do. That uh, and then vinyasa is great. Um, like my girlfriend does vinyasa, she does a great job at, at blending and balancing uh, different systems and different postures. Yeah, like it's all good. And um, but the thing I like about the Ashtanga is that, like I said, if you're seeking that like hamstring part of your hamstring to open. Yeah, it may not be in one particular pose. You may be breathing and feeling it there. There's no, there's no problem with feeling the sensation. It's just like you said, chasing it. I, li- I like that quote. Yeah. Um, you know, going after the sensation. But I found over time that like you have, you you can't help but have the sensation. Oh yeah. If you're in the sure. pose, you can't help it. But then it starts going away, like after the pose, after, and then you know yeah, they're, they're all yeah, yeah. connected. And then you'll find if you go back to that same pose, you won't feel it anymore. Exactly. But it's, but it's not the particular pose that does it. It's the stringing of poses mm-hmm. together that help the body release and, and, and lose memory mm-hmm. instead of keep the memory of injuries or troubled areas. Mm-hmm. So I like that. I really like that. Yeah. I think uh, one thing I've found lately is with, with yoga is relaxing is the most important. Like I used to be, you know, and when I was in a pose, I would be like – like I just said, hunting for the sensation. You know, I'd notice that there's like, okay, there's this part of my body that's tight. Let's well, there's like... no, I don't think there's a problem with the examination of yeah. sensation. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah but I if get... you're looking to get the high of, you know, going for it every time. Exactly. It's more like, yeah, yeah. you know, I feel I like there's one part of my body and if I can iron that out, then I'll achieve, you know, some blissful state of for the rest of my day. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I could... I could speak from fact and from listening to all my instructors and mentors, and, you know, and this is funny. The Ashtanga thing is really funny. So I practice with a gentleman, uh, Patabi Joyce. He's the, you know, grandmaster of Ashtanga yoga. Mm-hmm. And he gave a talk one time. He was like, no master, no master of any pose. He's like, he, and he said it in broken English. And, um, he said, Basically, once you master this one, I got another one for you. You know, like, that's great. I'll give you another one. It doesn't end. So, that's awesome. you know, once you get past this, you have something else to do, and it's just better just doing it instead of you know making it. You know, you definitely don't want to make it a flashy thing because that's not sustainable. Yeah. Um, and I say, you know, do yoga a hundred percent for you. Don't. How do I? How do I say this? <laughs> hundred percent for you to make you a better person to help others there you go yeah something like that because you know you need to do it yourself to share Mm -hmm. you can't speak from you know same thing in jujitsu like if you don't know how to do it no one's i mean it's a real sport a real martial art like if you're fake about it and you're not practicing people will know and they don't respect it as much yeah it's a really good way to put it yeah phil this has been great you're the man before we wrap this up, is there anything you'd like to promote? Um, no, go go train. I'll promote. Just go to your academy, train hard, mm-hmm. do yoga. You know, I don't really those those two things are important. Yeah. Um, 
don't get discouraged. Everybody taps. <laughs> These are things that like I try to tell people like you want to like someone was asking me, how do you stay in the game for 30 years? You know, and one, it's a different game for me now than it was then. Yeah. You know, I'm not competing. I don't really get as excited thinking about competition. I might at some point. I don't know. Um, but I like to maintain my training. You know, I go five days straight every week, two days off. So I'm sitting on an off day. That's why I can have the energy to speak to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, just keep a consistent practice. Seek the best people. You know, you should be in an academy that's open mm-hmm. and open-minded. So you can, you know, I don't think 100% of the answer is within your own place. That it's okay to reach out and listen yeah. to other instructors and see other people. I feel like it can't so, be. You know, there's no way. It can't be no, in your place. Like, not at there's, all. there's no place in the world where everyone, it's got, you know, John Danaher's leg locks and Hodger Gracie's, you know, uh, everything. <laughs> you know, and, and your, yeah. your well, yoga, there, too. I mean, et cetera, et cetera. One of the greatest teams on the planet, and then they're still evolving. And right. John will tell you that. They're still correcting or fixing. And then, and then it's like person-specific. So maybe, um, you know, one of the fighters does it a little differently than the other guy. So, yeah, exactly. You know, what is perfect. So, yeah, at least, you know, enjoy the journey. And that's corny. But it is. That's that's the fact. Like you know, enjoy the whole. Like if you're a white belt, really enjoy that white belt. Seriously, you know. Yeah. Some days I like to go back to putting a white belt on, but you know, if you just have a learning mindset, you are a white belt. Right. Right. Yeah. When I got my well, purple belt, I realized like that being a blue belt was great. You know, like <laughs> yeah. there wasn't so much pressure. I mean, of course, pressure is just you know from me. Like I'm the only one pressuring me at the end of the day. But, yeah. you know, um, nevertheless, I've, I was like, oh, well, I, I will never go back to that. You know, I will never yeah. go back to, yeah, to that state. And it's over. And I did. I felt like I did do a decent job enjoying it. But, you know, now that I'm here at Purple Belt, I feel like I'm, I'm good here for a long time. Yeah, you know? and enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Good here for a long time. Well, anyway, Phil, thank you so much Seven for doing the show. Too. thank you so much for doing this show you're the man no problem thanks so much man yeah i'll talk to you again soon thanks again to phil for being on the show if you guys want more information about all the stuff we talked about during this episode go to matrix.com and see the show notes a lot of you guys don't know the struggles that go on behind the scenes of the matrix bjj podcast There's not too many struggles, you know, I don't want to like lead you guys on and make you think like, oh shit, they're going through like some catastrophic emergencies. Not really, but there were a few technical difficulties, I will admit. And if you were looking for our podcast on Stitcher, Google Play, and a few other places, you were going to run into some trouble because they, it wasn't working. There's technical difficulties. Um, I think there was some sort of like evil robot, cyber being, advanced AI that maybe infiltrated the the Matrix uh, website, something along those lines, I'm sure. But nevertheless, we have emerged victorious. You can now find the Matrix BJJ podcast on Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn, a bunch of other random podcast directories that I'd never heard about, but there you will find the show. So if you're listening right now on iTunes and you're like, geez, I hate iTunes. The only reason I come here is for the Matrix podcast. Um, Never fear. You can go to Stitcher. You can go to Google Play. You can even go to YouTube. All the episodes, I figured it out. I figured out how to put them on YouTube. So they're there. They're there. If you do go to Stitcher and you start listening on that, give us a review on Stitcher and it'll really help to support the show. Additionally, just yesterday... I launched the Matrix newsletter. So if you're like, man, these podcasts are awesome, but if only I could like read something instead of listening to something. Maybe you're at work and you can't listen to a podcast or something. Um, first of all, you could get headphones, but you know, maybe headphones aren't allowed at your job. Who knows? Regardless, I've, I'm trying to take you into consideration and develop a newsletter. So if you go to matrix.com, there are several different places on the website that will say, enter your email here for the newsletter. And that is where you put in your email. So 
if you would like to receive some emails, uh, maybe you're only getting like 25 emails a day and you wanna up that to like 26, um, then go ahead, this is, the, this is the place for you. As always, please go to iTunes and give us a five star rating and a review. This is a awesome way to support the show iTunes bases a lot of their search rankings and results off of how many ratings and reviews a podcast has received. So if you want to support the show and you enjoy, you know, the other episodes and this one, then that's a really great way to show us some support. As always, thanks to my great friends in Waves Overhead. Waves Overhead is a band that is from my home state of Maryland in the United States. They are a pop punk band and they have some really outstanding music. Their song, To Make Amends, is the official theme music of the Matrix podcast. If you want to support Waves Overhead, go to wavesoverhead.bandcamp.com. You'll be able to download all of their music and you can send them a little bit of financial goodness. So the way Bandcamp works is you can download the music and you pay whatever you want. So you could pay zero dollars and you could get their entire uh, their entire album or you could give them two hundred dollars. You could give them three hundred dollars. You know, you could give them five hundred dollars or you could give them five bucks and just buy them a coffee. Totally up to you. Um, they're great guys. Really, really enjoy their music. And uh, I hope you guys do. Thank you.